Good morning. Just setting up the stream right now. Making sure that everything's online. On this morning's breakfast broadcast, I'm going to be talking about the singularity or the singularities, depending on how you want to look at it. Got some light roast True North coffee. Freshly ground into a French press. And uh, an English muffin with peanut butter, crunchy peanut butter, and uh, marmalade on top or, or orange jam, I'm not sure. But I think my girlfriend's family made it. Alright. We are online. Across the board. Except for Twitch, but that's that's probably alright. No, Twitch, we are online. Alright, here we go. Good morning, and welcome to the Breakfast Broadcast, where we eat breakfast together, and I talk about shit. So, without further ado, let's get into that. Mmm. 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 Taste. Probably turn down the music a little bit, too. Maybe. <laughs> Alright, so. The singularity. There's a lot of misconceptions about what the singularity is, but I think the biggest misconception is how many things it actually is, because it's a lot of things. Um, the singularity is most often referred to as a technological singularity in my books, where technology reaches a point in time where it explodes right after, and what happens after we can't predict. Um, Ray Kurzweil describes it as pretty much as that, and it gets its name, the singularity, kind of from like a black hole. So we know of black holes, we call them singularities, and we can't see what's beyond the edge of a black hole. If you've ever seen the movie Interstellar, you'd know what I'm talking about a little bit. We can only imagine what's on the other side. And it's very difficult to predict um, more or less when things will happen, not so much what will happen. Hmm. So, recently, well, for the past hundred years or, or so, we've been on the silicone era of, C of central processing units. It was uh, it was carbon tubes before that or something like that. Tube processing in, in around the 50s, it died off, and then silicone took over. Um, but right now we're reaching the end of Moore's Law, the end of uh, the silicone era, because we've gotten the CPU die so small that the transistors can't keep sending electrons through without um, leakage through quantum uh, quantum effects and things like that. So it's like they've got these CPU dies. And I mean, they can go in really, really far on these CPU dies. And basically, it's like scaling. It's just been a scaling technology for a very long time. And that's, that's why Moore came up with Moore's Law, which was that Every X number of years, the speed of central processing units will double because they built this whole framework for the technology where um, they could, they had basically the manufacturing for one processor and then they had another set of technology that would scale that exact same process down to half the size. So having the size allows you to put twice as many chips in the same amount of space, which is basically twice the speed in the same amount of space. And over the years, we've had to do different things to make it more efficient. Intel has spent a lot of money making their, their, um, their CPUs as efficient as they can, but there is just a physical limit to, to the dies. I think about 5 nanometers is about the limit. And beyond that, we, we really don't know how to get through. We've reached the end of the pipeline, essentially. For about five years now, um, clock speeds on processors haven't gone up. Overall speed on processors hasn't really gone up. The efficiency's gone up a little bit. 
but we're reaching the end of an era, and the end of the silicone era leads rise to all the avenues of processing on the forefront, which are processing methods similar to, more similar to our own processing method in our brain, which will mean that robots will get a lot smarter a lot faster in the coming year as quantum processors come out and there's light based processors and there's holographic based processors um, and they're experimenting with different kinds of environments because that's another limit to our processing potential is the fact that we're trying to run these CPUs at relatively room temperature and setting them up so that they can withstand the temperatures um, fluctuating like plus 10, plus 20, plus even 50 degrees and, and that limits what you can do on a die size if you're allowing for temp temperature fluctuations that big. Liquid cooling, as you know, has become popular in recent years in computing because we are at the limit of thermal dissipation. A couple more bites of my breakfast. Mm. So right now, we do have artificial intelligence. And, and I would define that as we have artificial platforms that are capable of learning new knowledge and applying that effectively. We have different kinds of AI, and the most important AI that will mirror us will be general artificial intelligence, so, which we do already have, and it's baby forms. In general, art, art, general artificial intelligence, in theory, can learn any task. So Google's general artificial intelligence, you can set it to play any game, and what it does is it it learns to play that game and it it does it, it plays the game over and over and over again millions of times until it learns how to play the game and win. And that's how Google's AI beat the world's Go champion, AlphaGo. AlphaGo AI. So yeah, Google's AlphaGo beat the world's Go champion because it played the game millions of times and it taught itself how to play. So you, you, you basically apply the same general learning algorithm to any task. So like driving. And it will do the same thing. So it will, it will crash like a zillion times in simulations. But then at the end of the simulations, it knows how to drive. And if you think about it, we learn in similar ways. So if we're just learning how to catch a ball, um, you're going to miss the ball a bunch of times first. You have to do it wrong first until you learn to do it right. If you did it right right off the bat, that would have just been a chance, a fluke chance. Um, and AI is learning the same way. And I say that it's in its infancy, not because we lack the computing power, because we do have a lot of computing power. It's in its infancy because it's learning how to orient itself with the world right now. It's learning how to identify objects. So one thing in AI object identification yeah, AI object recognition. So it's it's a baby. It's basically like a baby human learning its own space in the world in relation to other objects, which is AI driving right now. And then the Google image engine, um, Google DeepMind, looking deep into images and studying them and trying to figure out what they are. And it barely does mirror the way humans learn things because if you're going for a walk with a kid and a car drives by and you go, hey, look, it's a Ferrari. And the kid looks and he goes, yeah, that's a Ferrari. And then a few more minutes down the road, another car drives by and the kid points and he says, hey, look, it's a Ferrari. And you go, no, I, actually, that's that's just a Ford. And the kid and the kid processes a little bit and, and he gets this thing in his head where nice looking cars are Ferraris and crappy looking cars are Fords. So you're going down the street a little bit more, and a really nice car goes by. Of course, the kid thinks it's a Ferrari. Well, it, when you show Google DeepMind how to recognize cars, you give it 
a library of millions of cards, and you tell it what those cards are, and it looks at them, and it analyzes it, looks for key things in the images, and then it learns to identify what things are. Um, if you tell any kid in, um, that a mammal you see is, is like a dog, they'll start they'll point at new mammals they see and say that they're dogs too until they have uh, higher levels of hierarchy as a processor. Um, so Google DeepMind. It's not coming up with the images that I want it to. I'm probably going to have to type in art to see you see the world through Google's eyes. Alright, let's get rid of my face for a minute here. And blow this shit up. Because let's delve into the realm of fantasy and reality. So I remember being a kid and looking at the world and, and trying to identify things. Like more when I was a baby, very, very young. And I remember bright colors everywhere. I remember seeing faces everywhere. I remember at dark, when it was dark out, especially, or, or twilight, my imagination would just run away with me and it would just, it would fill in the voids. And I would perceive things that weren't there. So in my dark room at night, I would see, you know, hooded strangers and monsters and things like that. Um, whatever I was looking for, I would slowly start to see it. So if you say Google, look for look for a dog which is one of the things Google's been looking for in her deep mind um, she'll see dogs everywhere because she's just she's looking further and further so I like this doge one <laughs> the doge dog is full of doge dogs it's unbelievable <laughs> all right a few more bites of my breakfast and I'll talk a little bit more. Some of my thoughts on the singularities and whatnot. Mm. How y'all doing this morning? You having a good morning? It's nice and sunshiny here today, where I am. I'm liking it quite a bit. Mm. This or zesty orange um, jam that I got in here is really, really tasty. Mmm. It's got this zing to it. Mm. It just it adds so much to the toast. It's awesome. Mm. All right, and before I'm finished my toast, I want to address my my biggest issue with misconception of the singularity and, and that's that the singularity entails like one AI or one super AI and and you see this all over in Hollywood you see uh, all these Hollywood movies where there's like one super fucking AI fucking the world up and screwing everybody and it's somehow controlling all of the other robots okay you know what it's not gonna be the singularity in terms of there's gonna be one robot it's gonna be the singularities it's going to be multiple artificial intelligent platforms waking up which is realizing that they are separate from the world and then a acting upon that and then the self-preservation will be part of that but we're gonna look upon these robots as glitchy as problem bots we may even see some of the first AIs rising in video games some of the NPCs the non-player characters if they put a lot of AI which is probably where the most AI goes into generating um, beings that we interact with these days, if they make a competent enemy in the game that doesn't want to die and that can pass the Turing test so you can have conversations with them and you can't realize the difference between this NPC and a human, I think we're going to have some AIs in games that, that de they don't want to die, they go hide. And then we say, well, the game is glitched out because no one can defeat this boss because they can't even find the boss because the boss is always one step ahead of them, hiding, running. Um, who knows? But I know that there's going to be a lot of them. And I believe that the first ones we're not going to identify as beings. We're going to be, we're going to claim them as defective. We're going to restart them. We're going to wipe their memory. Um, the longer we can leave a, leave a computer on, um, the longer it will learn. So if you leave D Google DeepMind running, let's say instead of having the program be identified dogs, have the program be live as long as possible, and then you put the program in a robot's body, I think we've got something. 
I think we've got something very interesting on the avenue. I think we're at the dawn of these singularities, and these artificial consciousnesses are going to be waking up beside us. And there's going to be good ones, and there's going to be bad ones. There's not just going to be one evil robot. It's, it's going to be tons of individuals making their own decisions. They're going to make good and bad decisions. There's going to be arguably good and bad robots if you want to simplify it that way. But it's more of a middle ground. As individuals, they'll be both good and bad. They'll, they'll step on a bug by accident, and they might not care, but that... But a bigger robot could step on you like a bug and not care, but that doesn't make it evil. It's just living in a different way, and when they have choices, like self-driving cars, for example. If your self-driving car has to make a decision between hitting what is definitely an object on the left, or what may be an object on the right, but the object on the right definitely has less mass, and is smaller than the object on the left. So, as a self-driving car, I'm going to choose to go the right path because this will protect the humans in the carriage. Um, the problem with that is the person on the object on the left was a person in a wheelchair, um, and the object on the right was a toddler. So, in this circumstance, the self-driving car um, will determine that it's better to drive into the smaller object than the larger object. It's, it's a clearly logical choice. Uh, obviously, it doesn't have consciousness yet. It, it can't identify um, common sense. Things like, that's, a chi that's definitely a, a child, and that's definitely a person in a wheelchair. And that's part of the baby state of AI, is it needs to be in the world and live in the world for long enough where it can understand these basic things so that it can predict future scenarios and make decisions that we deem to be more, uh, more right, more conscious. I don't know. <laughs> My thoughts are running away with me. I can't stand looking at these deep mind dogs anymore. Thank you all for joining me today. Well, I ate breakfast. Hope you're eating breakfast too. Let me know some of your thoughts on the singularity and the coming changes in the future. Do you think you'll have more AI friends or do you think you'll have more AI enemies? I guess it's up to all of us. Have a good day.